Wow. Welcome to lecture 11. This is the Qumran manuscripts. So what we're really looking at and what's so valuable about this is this is going to show us the divergent different, the divergent different traditions that were uh, alive during this time period that we knew about to a degree. Obviously, we knew about the different Jewish sects, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots. There were other minor groups. We, we understood that. But now we're really getting much more into the nitty gritty, particularly of what was going on textually speaking, because we, we covered some of these texts and particularly it's going to give us some more insight into the Qumran sect as well, being that some of these texts are particularly sectarian in nature. In other words, relate to their sect in particular here. Oh, sorry, click toy. Okay. So uh, we should note that we have, we're dealing with here oral and written traditions. So all our oral traditions are obviously passed down orally, someone tells them. And written traditions are obviously copied. Uh, now it's likely when these were being told in a more formal setting, of course, that uh, the person telling it may have had the text in hand and was still speaking and disseminating it to others. And then when others passed it on, then they didn't have the manuscript in front of them. And of course, if at a printing press, people are much less likely to have copies. So even if the original person who's telling it orally has the text in front of him, once it gets to the second and third person, it's less likely that uh, it's more likely there are going to be differences. It's also uh, important to point out, and I heard this from uh, Bart Ehrman, who does some of these uh, great courses uh, series, pointed out that people often think that in the ancient world, the oral story was sacred, so you couldn't mess with it. You couldn't add your own variations. And he says, that's probably really not true, actually. While the stories may have been sacred, he points to studies which have been done, which repeatedly show that when people have the ability to tell the story and they realize it's not being recorded, it's not being written down, they're more likely to make little embellishments, changes uh, to slant the story they want it simply because there's no record being taken of. And think about if you're retelling something to somebody and there's no formal record of it happening, you, you may allow yourself, it doesn't mean you're a bad person, it means you, it's just human nature, you may allow yourself a little more freedom. So uh, keep that in mind as we talk about some of these oral traditions, even though we'll really be focusing on these written texts today. So to, speaking of divergent traditions, the first time the Torah was translated, translated at all into any language from Hebrew was into Greek, the Septuagint. I think we mentioned already the, the famous legend about Ptolemy, the, uh, the, Greek, the Greek king who's ruling as a pharaoh in Persia about the year 250 or so BC common era, they think that the, uh, the Torah is translated into Greek. So the legend is that Ptolemy, the king says, oh, the Torah, this is a magnificent work these Jewish people have. It should be, trans it should be translated. So we lock 70 rabbis into 70 different rooms and says, translate the Hebrew into Greek. And miraculously, when they emerge, it's all the same translation. The point of the story is that the understanding of the Torah was so firm and the tradition was so solid that when the rabbis even had it translated into another language, it was still identical. Now, that's a legend. The real point, the real point is that is simply Jews were living in Greek-speaking Egypt and Alexandria in particular, and they wanted a translation just as the way we have translations into English. There was a need for it, so a translation comes up. We also have translations into Aramaic, the famous Targum Unculus, and if you look at most Humashim on the inside towards the binding of the book, you'll see Hebrew script uh, a little uh, smaller, usually smaller than the text of the regular Torah, but if you start reading the words, you'll notice it's not Hebrew, even though it's Hebrew letters. That's the translation into Aramaic, translated by a guy named Unculus, who's actually a convert to Judaism. Then we have translations later on into Syriac and Latin, as well as other languages as well. Obviously, we know we have eventually English as well. Okay, so one of the differences uh, between the uh, Hebrew version and the Septuagint, there are minor if you if you read closely there are, really are minor differences it's not it's not a even even though the legend is when they translated it the greek translation was exact if you look at the meaning actually at times there are differences i'll give you an example the torah says that when uh when jacob's family went down to mitzrayim to egypt there are 70 people the septuagint puts it at 
75 people. So in the Greek version it says there's 75 people. The Qumran texts that are recovered, by the way, agree with the Septuagint, not the Hebrew version, which will be called the Masoretic text. We'll speak about that very soon. Okay, so I'll give you another example with very practical implications here for how this is really handled. Um, let me just click on the, the next uh, bullet point as well to bring it up. No, it's not there. Okay, just give me one second. I thought I pasted in the Hebrew here. Okay, but uh, so we have in Exodus, there's a famous passage in Parshat Mishpatim, which is talking about uh, two guys are fighting and one of the uh, two guys are fighting and one of them actually accidentally uh, collides into a pregnant woman, causing her to miscarry. So uh, the Hebrew says there's a uh, there's low ason. There's no uh, which is understood to be no damage. No damage. In, in other words, in other words, the miscarriage is not considered. Or there's no fatality or like damage in the sense of a fatality. So therefore, we learn from that that a fetus is property and not life. In other words, it's not a murder, or a murder is a wrong word. It's not a manslaughter that he hit the pregnant woman and caused the miscarriage, because it, it's it's referred to here as a as a, a monetary form or a lack of mon, uh, a monetary issue. There's no there's no uh, there's no fatality to there's no fatality. Uh, the husband of the woman is is. Um, is entitled to monetary, by the way, to monetary uh, uh, reparations. Rabbi? Yes. So uh, we have um, uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews that would consider abortion to be um, uh, a uh, crime under Judaic law or Hebraic law. Um, our, a, a traditional uh, Jewish congregation and you as a rabbi would uh, based upon this uh, clause, not agree with that interpretation? So I would not agree with that interpretation. There's no, there's not a, there's not a blanket ban on abortion in Judaism. It's not the uh, people sometimes, I think, get confused as well. And it may be observant people themselves may get confused as well just uh be, well let, let me actually let me actually I'll explain the next part bob that's actually a good segue and this is going to fit together nicely so what happened is so what happened is philo of alexandria uh and greek uh, he's the leading greek speaking jew for a century common era so what does he say he says the word ason doesn't mean um doesn't mean damages it means that there's no form yet in other words the fetus fetus hasn't form jet so what he's saying is if the guy collides into the pregnant woman before 40 days according to the talmud it's before 40 days the fetus is considered persha which is water so if he collides into the fetus before 40 days there's no, there's no there's no there's no form to it so there's no there's no penalty there however after 40 days when the baby has a form at that point then he's guilty of killing or, or manslaughter, whatever legal term you want to use. Uh, Rabbi, follow yes. up. Uh, the 40 days, um, uh, what prompted the 40 days in, uh, use uh, back when this uh, was first enunciated? And today, is there any medical basis that coincides with uh, that decision at that time to use 40 days? Okay, so as far as 40 days, it's mentioned in the Talmud. Uh, why it's mentioned, I don't, I don't know where they necessarily got that piece of science from or attempted piece, of whatever you want. Uh, I mean, they didn't have all our technology with the ultrasounds, but I don't know why necessarily they came up with that number, but that number is mentioned in the Talmud as uh, when the baby starts to have a form. So as far as modern science, uh, are there any doctors? I think I saw Rich and uh, I know Neil was on. Any doctors? Uh, I'll make a screen? comment. I, I uh, don't is think- that, uh, Gene, is that Gene? Okay, terrific. Yeah, Gene. Um, you have uh, babies who are born prematurely and it's extremely rare that a baby would survive 
before 21 weeks. There may have been a report or two of a baby surviving at 20 weeks, but be before that, it's not viable outside of the womb. Okay, okay, thank you, Gene. So, uh, so for whatever for whatever reason, at an early point, uh, at, uh, during the Talmudic era, let's say ending a fifth century common era, there there seems to be this idea that uh, at 40 days the fetus takes on some sort of more of a recognizable form, as opposed to being just uh, water okay and there, there there's another i'm thinking of another instance in the talmud where there was medical advice of, of sorts given in a reproductive sense which doesn't really bear out remember this was much earlier uh on before they had all this medical technology the suggestion is that the most the most effective way to for uh a couple to have a child is if the woman is is young and the man is uh, more uh, a little more up there in age, maybe perhaps a little more middle aged. So we were discussing this, and Lenny Seltzer happened to be there. So I said, Lenny, is this? There's any science to this? And he said, No, no science to it. And so it just may have been what people uh, may have been what people thought at the time. Not necessarily not necessarily scientifically accurate. So uh, back to Bob, finishing uh, Bob's question. So what now happened? was that uh, the Septuagint, which uses Philo's translation, saying uh, really considering the, uh, the word assume to be a, a form, is used as the Catholic, uh, as the uh, template for the Catholic uh, biblical canon. So uh, they, they follow that, and that's why you, that's why you have uh, more prohibitive views of uh, abortion and Catholicism than you do in Judaism. We we don't make law directly from the Torah. Uh, we our law uh, our law really comes uh, through the, the Talmud looking at the Torah. So the Talmud the Talmud does clarify this uh, to a degree, even though it still leaves it wide open for uh, for different ways of interpretation. It, it says that. Uh, it, can I interrupt at that point? Well, yeah. I thought, um, we we're now going back and touching on a point before where we talked about. Uh, there were literalists, uh, for example, um, the the, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, were in the in the uh, care of the literalists, uh, whereas uh, the type of um, tradition we have doesn't follow that form of literacy. But so it was the Sadducees, which were literally the literalists, and then the Karaites picked up the mantle. The Dead Sea sect. I'm not sure if they were really literalist. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll go on in the course. We'll see how that's if they're described. But it was really the Sadducean school, which was known for being the literalists. So, uh, so, but what happens as the as the Talmud as the Talmud as the Talmud develops, and this is really a Pharisaic school, which becomes a rabbinic camp, is you have this idea that uh, you're allowed to have an abortion in the case of a kasha which means a difficulty. Now, you don't need to be a great lawyer to realize that when you tell somebody you could have an abortion in a case of a difficulty, that is very subjective. Rabbi uh, Uziel, uh, Rabbi, yeah, first chief Sephardi rabbi of Israel, allowed a woman to have an abortion because if she kept on with the pregnancy, she would have lost her hearing. I don't remember the scientific rationale, but there's a scientific reason for, for that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, rabbis have not permitted abortion in, uh, with serious genetic, when it's already shown that the baby is going to be born with serious genetic diseases and, and problems. So it's, it's very subjective. It depends who you're really asking. And it's, uh, it's, very, it's very wide open to interpretation in, in a practical sense. Now, to Bob's point, certainly... Uh, the sociological tr trend in Haredi communities or ultra-Orthodox communities is they're less likely to uh, permit an abortion probably than a, a more uh, more liberal rabbis, more liberal communities. Uh, some, of, some of that may or may not have to do with, uh, well, some of that has to do with just general sociology. Some of it may have to do with uh, perhaps uh, Christian influence, uh, as well, uh, you could certainly make those go back and forth and look at that and make those arguments. So good, good point, Bob. Uh, just to follow up, um, yes, I haven't seen this uh, 
last this most current season of Stitzel, which you turned us all on to. But I've read that it touches on the issue of abortion and that the interpretation seems to be not flowing with the Haredi uh, traditional view given today's uh, background. That's what I read. I haven't seen it yet, so I can't say. Yeah, I, I, I want to, well, I know I'm, uh, I, it came no, out. No spoilers, no spoilers, uh, please. No, 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 no spoilers. Uh, don't spoil it for me. I have not seen it yet. I, and I'm very much looking forward to watching it. I haven't it. seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet either. Okay, good. So no one, no one will spoil it. No one will spoil it. So, uh, so I mean, you could certainly, you can certainly find uh, instances where you could, where you could argue the practices and reality in the Haredi community may not be in full accordance with a uh, with a read of halacha, just as you could uh, make that critique of other communities as well. Quite honestly, so uh, that doesn't. Well, while I know sometimes people are surprised and they think of all oh, the Haredi, they must do it exactly like the halacha requires. Well, that not necessarily. You really have to be fair. You really have to look at the look at the sources and then look at the behavior and see if it matches up or not. Uh, uh, just as an example of that, the Haredi community or some uh, some Haredi don't believe to follow uh, the public health directorate of the CDC and WHO uh, about wearing masks. Okay, uh, so 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 yeah. that's that's a point that I may I've made and many people have many people including some in the Haredi. I heard a uh, he was a British guy. But uh, he's a uh, he lives in Israel uh, and he's a, he identifies as a Haredi Jew. He's the editor of one of the papers, and he was highly critical of members of his own community, basically for saying uh, Jewish law really requires you to take these health measures and follow these uh, follow these guidelines uh, for issues of pikuach nefesh, saving life, uh, dina de mahuta dina, the law is the land of the law of the land, and these type of reasons and. Uh, you, I, I would agree there are certainly issues that really have been very stark and good examples of that. Okay, thank you. Good points, Bob. Ancient manuscripts. Before the discovery of the scrolls, only ancient Hebrew text, the only ancient Hebrew text was the Nash papyrus found in Egypt in 1898. So basically it's saying all the texts we had be, before the scrolls are really from the uh, medieval era, a little later. Uh, but in this particular text, we find, uh, which is dated to 125 before the Common Era, so this is during the Second Temple period, we're talking about, we find the Ten Commandments there and the Shema, which are both parts of Torah, so these were not like a, a full volume of Torah, but they found the text containing uh, two of the more famous parts of Torah. Uh, and then we have these medieval, medieval texts like the Aleppo Codex, which is a famous one, uh, which is dated to about 900 uh, CE and the Leningrad uh, Codex uh, 1009. And these are known as the uh, Masoretic text. The word Masoretic means uh, tradition. And so it's like handed down from one generation to the next. Uh, the, Dead sea Scrolls can, the Dead Sea Scroll collection contains copies of 230 biblical books and all are represented except except Megillah Esther, except the book of Esther. The only full one they have, however, is Isaiah. Uh, and in, in that, linguistic up updates were made, which deviate from the Masoretic text. So even though the Masoretic text we're talking about is found in the Aleppo Codex and the Leningrad Codex, it's believed that, uh, it's believed that these texts are really ancient texts. And already in Qumran, what they're finding is texts which were updated to use more up-to-date language than perhaps in the early uh, early biblical period, uh, in antiquity already they're updating the language uh, to make it more to make it more modern. Okay, uh, so the most represented among the Dead Sea Scrolls, the texts are Deuteronomy, Psalms, uh, and Isaiah, which are also the most cited in the Christian Bible. So you could say during the uh, period of uh, the Christian canon forming, the Jewish texts which were trending were Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Isaiah. So we get a bit of connection there. The texts that seem to be important to the sect were also the same ones which are important to this community. They may have been important just in general at that time. These were texts which were speaking to the times uh, and people really related to them. Okay, 
So we also have we also have uh, other texts as well found uh, like uh, ge like Genesis like uh, Genesis Exodus Leviticus uh, and the 12, 12 minor prophets and Daniel these are the next I meant next most popular text found in the collection and we'll talk about Daniel again we spoke about this but I'll just remind you so Daniel is an apocalyptic text talking about st really starts to talk about Judaism and life after death a lot more explicitly than any other Jewish text had up to that point. To, up to that point, you have these references about people lying with their ancestors, dwelling in Shaol, which is some sort of never world of spirits, kind of like Hades, that type of thing. But now in uh, Daniel, suddenly we have the Hasidim, these righteous people are going to be resurrected to some sort of everlasting life of glory and the wicked to some sort of everlasting life of shame. So we're dealing, starting to deal with some sort of life after death, end of days, and much more explicit terms here. Now, scholars believe at least the second half, perhaps all, if not the second half of Sefer Daniel, the book of Daniel, is written in 160, 164 as the Hasmoneans or Maccabees are revolting against the Greeks. And it's, it's believed basically this uh, supports the theme you see, particularly in two Maccabees, which is keep the faith, even if you see Jews who, uh, Jews who are being righteous and not becoming Hellenized and are suffering, uh, don't be discouraged by the fact that they're suffering because if you're not rewarded in this world, you'll be rewarded in the next world. In other words, you'll be resurrected in the next world. God will pay you back. And those people who took the easy path and uh, became super Hellenists, God will also hold them accountable and they'll have to pay the price. Okay, so uh, say for Daniel, by the way, uh, the, the copy is stated between 125 and 100 or so. Uh, so it's only, uh, it's not that long before the sect really came on the scene. So uh, it's already, we're getting into uh, the era where it, you really start getting more of a window into what's going on versus them. And this is something I thought of myself here, but it, probably other people have thought of this too is you could see why a sect like the Dead Sea sect would really like something like, uh, say for Daniel, because it has a very us versus them mentality. In other words, uh, we, the Hasidim, the followers of the Maccabees are pious. Hasidim literally meaning pious. The Jews who are engulfed in Hellenization and are selling out, they're wicked. Similarly, the, um, the, 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 the Qumran community has this type of philosophy as well. In other words, we're pious, we're the sons of light, and the other Jews, they're the sons of dark. And as for the non-Jews, we're not even getting that, we can't even bother with them, they're so removed. Okay, let's move on here. Okay, so we have nine copies of the book of the Torah written in Paleo Hebrew script. So let me just explain Paleo Hebrew script. That script found in ancient Canaanite inscriptions in ancient Israel. And it's believed to be the original script of the Torah here. So this is really, so this is again, the, the Canadian inscriptions uh, found in ancient Israel. And uh, so, so nine copies of the books of Torah in this uh, ancient script, uh, which is more ancient than the uh, versions of the Torah we have. Now in the other copies, this, in the copies which follow the Masoretic, the regular script of the Torah, the newer type of the newer type of uh, script. Other copies, the sect wrote uh, the sect still copied God's name, the Yudhei Vavhei, in the ancient in the ancient uh, Paleo Hebrew script, while the rest was in the newer script. So they found something important still about writing God's name, at least in the uh, this original. Okay. Now we should point out we're talking about deviations here. The Qumran texts usually follow the Masoretic text. They'll match up with Aleppo Codex type of stuff. But uh, some do have these linguistic updates, including a, a specific Qumran form of Hebrew as well. So uh, these differences don't last forever. We've already said they're not really major. They're fascinating, but they're not major. But eventually they seem to uh, go out of usage. At Masada and nearby caves at Angedi, in the Angedi area, texts were found which match the Masoretic text. Uh, so it's believed that the variations came to an end shortly after the Qumran period ended. The Qumran period ends in 68 Common Era. 
uh, and the caves of Engedi include Masoretic texts from the Bar Kokhba era at 135 of the Common Era. So this is this is not that much later on. This is uh, this is 50 something years later on. We, we're no longer finding these variant texts. We're simply finding the standard type of uh, Masoretic text that we're familiar with. And by the late first century, early second century, variations were considered beyond the pale or not acceptable anymore. Okay, now it's unclear if this really ended sectarianism, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the Essenes, that type of thing. It was believed that it really did with a standardization of text, even though it's text, even though scholars are not really uh, not really sure. And again, just to emphasize, despite the fascinating differences, they have a lot more in common with their medieval counterparts than they really have uh, as differences. Okay. So next lecture will be alternative views on the Qumran scroll. Let me X out of here, stop picture, and we'll open it up to Q and A. And then we go to Harriet who had their hand up. Well, first of all, I don't think sectarianism has ever ended actually. We certainly see it in our day. And also, I don't know if this would be too difficult for you, but I would find it helpful to have a timeline that says, you know, um, BCE 30, 60 to 30 is this sect. 135 to 20 is Daniel. You know, some it's getting confused in my mind. Who came? Well, if you want, that? Harriet, I believe he has a timeline in the back of the book. And which I could book? scan that. I, the, one of the books I'm using, which I'm getting oh. my, I'm getting it from two sources, oh. from two different guys who taught this class. One of them has a timeline, so I could scan it and, and share it for next Please. time. Please share it. I'd be happy to. Okay. Uh, what else? What else was? Uh, so, so yeah, it, it clearly didn't end. Uh, when I say sectarian era, I mean particularly the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes. Obviously. Uh, it's not like all the Jews are sitting around singing kumbaya and all little differences go away. Obviously, that didn't happen. We we know uh, uh, we see we, we see we see uh, particularly in the next the, the other course we did we see we have the Baghdad group uh, and then we have the Jews in Europe. This is later on, but again, this fighting, this this carrying on, and all of that stuff. And we we have different Jews uh, Jewish groups going. We have an early exilic community in Rome. They have the Roman Hagim. So just as far as the Pharisee, Sadducees, a, spleen, uh, a scene split, uh, we're not exactly sure when it ended, but we do know basically <laughs> what, what does eventually make it go away is simply uh, <coughs> the, Essene, the Essenes and the Sadducees disappear. The Sadducees don't have a temple, so they're kind of out of business. Their whole, uh, their whole uh, existence revolved around the temple. And the Essenes were a smaller group and uh, probably just for, weren't able to survive uh, the diaspora and probably assimilated into the Pharisaic or rabbinic camp, which was the last man standing, so they won the day. I can't hear, I didn't, we didn't hear the last part. Oh, I'm just saying the, uh, the, the Sadducees, their whole uh, reason for being revolved around the temple. And once the temple was destroyed, they didn't have uh, any reason to go on as a group. And the, and the Essenes were a smaller group. They probably just got assimilated into the uh, Pharisees, which really become the rabbinic group and are ultimately the last man standing. And they win. You see that in Josephus, how uh, at first he's super impressed with the Essenes when they're a, a viable group. He praises them much more than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then later on, after the temple has been destroyed and he's living in Rome, he praises the Pharisees. Why? Uh, because uh, he, if you can't beat him, might as well join him. But the last group there, he's still a practicing Jew. He wants to, uh, he wants to fit in. That's his only option at, at this point. All right, good questions, Harriet. I'll be happy to uh, work on getting that scanned in. Thank okay, you. Any, my pleasure. Anyone else? No, that was a mouthful I just gave you. No one has any other questions or comments? Well, I, I have just heard that if a child is born stillborn, you don't say Kaddish because it's not considered a real person yet. In other words, it's not a person until a certain time has passed 
after birth. That's correct. So uh, the halacha is that a um, a child who's stillborn is considered a uh, nefel, which means fallen, uh, bef- if they die before th- before thirty days. So the reason for that is uh, probably I'm, I'm giving a sociological reason, probably because it was so common for children to die before thirty days, whether it's stillborn or uh, just die after a few days. Probably there was a different mentality, and the, the mentality is probably just let's move on and not poise our lives as much. Uh, nowadays, nowadays with modern medicine, it's not as common. So I think it may, I'm not saying it didn't upset people, I'm sure it did, but there's just a different way of handling it. So, uh, so yes, so you're, you're, you're correct. And that's, that's, the, uh, that's the idea in Jewish law. And those people have said Jewish law really, in this case, needs to be updated as it doesn't reflect the reality. And when people, chas uh, v'shalom, are um, found in these situations or find themselves in these situations, they feel a certain amount of uh, emptiness. Look, I had it to me. We had a stillborn uh, a daughter and there was a lack of... Um, a lack of ritual, which was which was very disappointing, I guess could be uh, the right word. I have a question. Uh, Susan. <clears throat> um, I don't understand. In I understand that, um, let's call it the ultra-Orthodox or the, the very pious Jews or whatever category we give them are very um, against abortion. And I always thought that they were against abortion because um, uh, the child had a life even before it was born. So maybe you can straighten me out on that. So in Judaism, in Judaism, we really consider, um, uh, well, I mean, it's basically under Jewish law, the fetus is considered property up until it's born. As the baby starts to come out, at that point, you can't abort. Uh, as the baby's now even being born, you can't even abort to save the mother because you don't tra- trade a nefesh tachat nefesh, which is a way of saying you don't tra- trade a life for a life. So that you can't do. But in the mother's womb, uh, the baby's considered, um, the, baby's con- the baby's clearly considered, uh, or the fetus is considered property. Where that is that is not uh, that's not the uh, Catholic take I, 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 or a Christian take or I, I understand that so it's a different take uh, there is a uh, there is a discussion in the Talmud I came across it not long ago again I forgot exactly how it goes but it it, it talks about uh, a suggestion that perhaps that abortion should be forbidden for uh, the Noahide in other words non pious non Jews who follow the seven Noahide laws but Jews could have a, an abortion up until the baby is born. And then it says, well, wait a minute, how could this be? We're going to, you, you, you're going to hold, you're going to hold no, uh, Noahides to a higher standard or a tougher standards than you have, than you um, hold Jews to. So it's an interesting discussion. I forgot exactly the nuances of it, but it's certainly a, an eye opening discussion. And uh, there was an, oh, so and the Talmud does say, by the way, it does say that even though the, the fetus is property, I forgot, I wish I remember where this is. It does say even though the fetus is property, it does point out that it's, it's special property. It's not like my water bottle here. If I happen to drop it on my driveway and run it over, I, I might be mildly far frustrated for a minute or so and then move on with my life. Where, um, where they're saying, no, this is at least very uh, precious and, and special property. So it, it certainly does, uh, does say that. So does that help, Susan? Um, not exactly, because I'm, I'm so curious about why this, these particular ultra-Orthodox sects uh, object to abortion if all that we're talking about is property. I, I, my, I, I just my, am not straight on that. Was someone else trying to uh, chime in? No, okay. My guess. Uh, well, well. First of all, there's there's two. So, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, because a couple people froze on my screen. Okay, I think there's two issues. In general, in the more orthodox world, it tends to be a proclivity towards being strict in general. 
now you raised a question, can you be stricter than the law requires? The answer is in certain sense, the answer is yes, I know. I know that's a very frustrating rabbinic answer. So what I mean, what I mean by that is you could make safeguards around the law and say, uh, like the rabbis do all the time, don't pick up this mouse on Shabbat, on Shabbos, uh, because it's because it's muksa. Because if you pick it up, you might accidentally come, accidentally come to click on it. So the rabbis say, you can't uh, you can't pick it up or move it. So that's putting a safeguard around around the law. So uh, that you certainly can do. You could say that Purim or Hanukkah or holidays, the rabbis obligate you to celebrate. But if you were to say that Hanukkah or Purim is a biblical holiday, or if you were to say that the Torah commands you instead of using four uh, species on Sukkot, you have to use five for the Lulav and Etrog, uh, Hadassah and Arava. You know, say you had to use, a, I don't know, a tomato with it, whatever it may be. Uh, that that would be a, a sin of Baal Tosif, which is adding on to the Torah. That you can't do, you can't because it's it's rejecting God's Torah, saying God's not firm enough for me, basically. So just as you're not allowed to detract from the Torah, and it talks about this a lot in the uh, in the Talmud in Horayot about how uh, you, you can't you can't permanently cancel a law. That's to say, uh, bet then can't. Uh, they can make an emergency decision and allow, say, maybe in a certain decision, people run out of food and they say, OK, you could have the chaz or you could have the pig because everyone is because people are going to starve to death or get sick or, or something like that. Fine. But a court can't come along and say uh, we're permanently canceling the concept of kashu. That a court can't do because that's detracting or taking away from the Torah. Uh, and likewise, the example I gave, particularly the Lula Venetric makes the point you can't you can't you can't add that in. You can't add that in as well. Uh, uh, on that theme, we just had Pesach, for instance. I think some people have a minhag to put an orange on the Seder plate. There are all different rationales given for it, but that's not my point. So uh, yeah, that's fine. You could put a, whatever on your Seder plate. You could put an orange. You could put, uh, again, a tomato, wh wh whatever. That's not really the issue. But if you were to say, the Torah commands us to have a tomato and it has to be eaten with the matzah to fulfill the mitzvah, Pesach, now you now this baltosi if you're adding on to the torah itself that's prohibited so in the observant community and there's been criticism perhaps and you have to go case by case to be fair this criticism maybe it's warranted maybe it's not that at times they uh add on to what the their view is overly expansive what the torah requires to the point that may actually be problematic under jewish law but my point is the knee-jerk reaction tends to be strict there so it's not particularly surprising they're going to take a strict view when it comes to what defines a difficulty in which abortion, abortion would be allowed. And part of it, I would sus sus uh, suspect at least, is there's a sociological influence with Christianity as well. You see a lot of back and forth where uh, at an early stage, Judaism uh, influenced Christianity. And then for those who did the Ruderbin course with me between the cross and the a Jewish life and Christian amongst some lands. We see at times Christian Christian thought and Islamic thought uh, influences Judaism. Uh, some of the uh, Jewish thoughts about afterlife are clearly uh, come from uh, Persian Zoroastrianism influence. So uh, that that wouldn't really surprise me. I, I strongly suspect that would be the case. Does that that help, Susan? Yeah, that I guess that explains it better. But I, I okay. can. Tell you now that you've explained it. Now I want to look it up. Yeah, and you're to... asking, right? And you just you're you're asking the wrong guy in a sense that I'm not an ultra orthodox Jew. So I understand. I yeah, mean, I got I, it. I'm kind of I'm kind of these are just my observations. Right? I have friends who are ultra orthodox Jews, and I have some insight into the culture, but uh, you're not getting it from the horse's mouth. I understand. Uh, Alan, I... Alan, I think yeah, had his hand up. Yeah, I'm. I don't claim to be. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, hit in possession of detailed knowledge on these points, but I'm surprised there's a term that has not emerged in our in Susan's question and some of the responses. Um, for a long time, I've understood the fetus has the role, if I can use it, uh, of potential life. Okay, and and I don't want to. Uh, to, to some extent, I'm distinguishing between property and uh, potential life, but uh, up to up to the uh, 
I'll loosely say the moment of birth, uh, my understanding is that the mother's life takes priority. And, mm -hmm. yes. and, and uh, whether it's the crowning or what part of the birth process, uh, this uh, transitions to, to a separate life, the, the 30 days notwithstanding that the rabbi mentioned, uh, at that point, uh, I understood the Judaic uh, tradition was that uh, the, the transition from fetus to birth um, now means that there are two people, personalities, whatever, involved, and one doesn't trade off one versus the other, as the rabbi said, which is, which is uh, why it, it, it's not halakha to uh, uh, kill somebody else to save your own life. Well, in, in, I, I think in, in the case where I was asking the question, I didn't think that it was a question of the death of the mother or the baby that was at stake. I just no, think no, I, there, I thought that there was a general objection to abortion. No, no, what I'm, what I'm saying is that, that I understood this classification of potential life until the moment of birth. And, uh, and, and, and one can discuss the medical aspects and, and when the moment of birth comes. But um, uh, that has only always given me solace in understanding the different argument. It doesn't give me any more insight to understand why somebody would hold a personal view saying why personal life should not be sacred. But I, but I okay. think it's always helped me to understand uh, why uh, if, if, if birth has not taken place, but a fetus is lost, it, uh, Judaically, I don't think it's considered murder. Because for murder, you have to uh, uh, take a person's life. And Correct. You need, you need a person. You need a person. As a potential to, person. Right. So, yeah, so yeah, it, it comes down, I think, to, to the perspective, which uh, now helps me get to a question. I've, I've had many discussions in the past. Uh, Rabbi, uh, if the law of the land says you cannot uh, perform an abortion uh, to save the mother's life. How how are observant Jews to respond to that? You're allowed you're allowed to violate under Jewish law the law of the land if you're if it's asking you to compromise Jewish observance. Just just like think about the Hasmonean revolt against the uh, against against the Greeks and yeah we, I know we've spoken about it and it was really more of a civil war than a, a war necessarily but but nevertheless. Uh, you had the Hasmoneans, the Maccabees, and these followers basically saying these mandates that uh, mandates or attempts to at least change Judaism to a point where really aren't, we we feel it's really watering it down to an unacceptable level. We're not going to put up with it. They were they were they were not going to accept that uh, outside authority. So uh, Dina the Muta Dina, law of the land, uh, requires you to um, observe the law as long as you're not uh, having to break Jewish law by observing it and then i mean it's always funny kids always come up with these great questions and and say um uh questions and say well what happens if i want to uh my mother asked me to do something or my father asked me to do something that violates that violates the torah you know things like the uh, same type of situations where you're basically you're taking two competing good goals and but you put them in competition so something has to give so in the case of in the case of this Jewish law is going to supersede the secular law as, fine, as far as the rabbis are concerned. And parents, by the way, are not supposed to put their children in a situation where you're asking your child to violate uh, to violate. OK, well, Rabbi, I, I, my, my last question here is uh, a Rachel Maddow style question. <laughs> uh, did, did, did I uh, in, 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 in my summary of, from my own view, did I express anything that is uh, inconsistent uh, 
with with uh, Jewish tradition. Wow! If I say if uh, if I give an answer, then you're going to go back and watch what you said, and you may catch me. So. <laughs> well, no about about the issue of potential life. I know. I'm just I'm just having I'm just having uh, just having fun. And, and, uh, it's, and it's, the it sounded it, it, sound, it sounded fine. It sounded fine to me, Alan. The, the analogy to property to me. Uh, was always along the lines of uh, what the penalty was. I mean, if you have a financial penalty for bringing about a miscarriage, uh, biblically, uh, that's that's sort of the way property loss is taken care of. Yeah, that's exa that's that's exactly the point. I mean, this is it gets into this. Uh, I mean, it, it comes. Uh, it I mean, just by context alone at least you could perhaps get that feeling because it's talking about these type of uh, financial loss type issues. Okay. So, uh, so yes, yeah, certainly. So, uh, Dad, Carl? Yeah, if I might interrupt, the Jewish position, I think, is a nuanced position. It's neither a prohibition nor permission. It's a balance. For example, <laughs> if there is the if there's a choice between the mother's life and the child's life, Jewish law dictates that the mother's life prevail. In Catholicism, it's quite the opposite. But I think where the conundrum might be is that when there is a, a miscarriage as described in the Torah, it's considered as a civil offense as opposed to a criminal offense because in Jewish law, that child, as Alan correctly points out, is potential life not actual life. And therefore, you can compensate the mother for the loss monetarily as opposed through a criminal penalty. Right, C -c correct. So that's a good way of putting it. So uh, I was gonna make a point and I completely, I completely blanked out. But um, okay, so uh, that was a wonderful discussion that went kind of on a very fascinating tangent as well. So thank you everyone.